In December 2006, it was revealed that the leader of the Somali opposition party, Avius, intended to stage a coup and was preparing to use assassination methods to overthrow the Somali government. In 2007, documents exposing the corruption of Kenya's former president, Mwa, during his term, involving embezzlement of £1 billion in national assets, were leaked. In 2010, 92,000 classified documents related to the Afghanistan war involving the US military were disclosed. During the 2016 US presidential election, the Hillary email scandal unfolded, revealing numerous and disclosed secrets. A website called WikiLeaks and its founder, Assange, might hold the answers to just how many unknown secrets exist in the world. Assange founded WikiLeaks in 2006, and in 2010, Interpol issued a red notice for his arrest. Subsequently, Assange sought refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy in London for seven years. In 2019, with a change in Ecuador's political regime, a new agreement was reached with the UK, allowing the London Metropolitan Police to enter the embassy and arrest Assange. Currently, Assange faces the imminent prospect of extradition to the United States. Some consider him a whistleblower hero, while others label him a espionage traitor. What exactly did Assange do to incur such deep animosity from multiple governments? Today, let's delve into the story behind this. If this is your first time tuning into our channel, the primary focus here is to provide critical perspectives on historical or societal controversial events, offering insightful descriptions and commentary. If you're interested, please consider subscribing to our channel and turning on the notification bell. Let's get started. In 1971, Julian Assange was born in the city of Townsville on the northeast coast of Australia. His biological mother, Christine Hawkins, and biological father, John Shipton, met during anti-Vietnam War protests, but separated before Assange's birth. When Assange was one year old, his mother married Brett Assange, and Julian adopted the Assange surname from his stepfather, his parents later co-managed a touring theatre, and Brett described Assange as having strong personal convictions about right and wrong, always supporting the underdog, and disliking those who joined forces to bully others. Assange had a happy childhood under Brett's care, Unfortunately, in 1979, when Assange was eight, his mother's marriage to Brett ended. Shortly after, Christine married musician Leif Maynell and had Assange's younger brother. However, Maynell was a fervent follower of an emerging religious sect, occasionally engaging in eccentric behavior, even considering offering Assange to their leader. In 1982, Christine divorced Maynell, taking Assange and his brother with her to escape his influence, leading to five years of a nomadic lifestyle to avoid Maynell's pursuit. In this unstable environment, Assange received sporadic education, often relying on self-learning at home. Christine held unconventional views on education, believing formal education would restrict children's thinking, instill harmful obedience to authority, and diminish their curiosity. Assange's turbulent upbringing made it challenging for him to establish trust in the world, leading him to envelop himself in a thick shell of sensitivity and paranoia. At the age of 14, Assange's life took a significant turn when he stumbled upon a computer in a storefront window. This accidental encounter changed his life completely. Obtaining his first computer marked the beginning of Assange's intense passion for programming. The binary codes, composed of zeros and ones, became the sole outlet for his talents. At 16, Christine bought Assange a modem, opening the doors to the world of the internet. In 1987, websites had not yet come into existence, but the framework for the internet and telecommunication systems was already taking shape. Assange chose the alias main desk for himself and became a hacker, drawing inspiration from the ancient Roman poet Horace's quote, meaning noble hypocrisy. Assange aimed to use his technical skills to expose all the darkness in the world. He later formed a hacking group called International Subversives with two other hackers, finding pleasure in uncovering secrets hidden in the online world. From Motorola's Bell Labs to Lockheed Martin, Stanford Research Institute, and the Pentagon, Assange left backdoor programs in these network systems. In an underground manifesto co-authored with writer Silent Dreyfus, Assange outlined his hacker beliefs. First, do not damage the computer systems you infiltrate. Second, do not alter information within those systems. Third, share the information acquired. In 1989, at the age of 18, Assange married his 16-year-old girlfriend and fathered a son named Daniel. By this time, hacking had become Assange's daily routine, and within the International Subversives Hacking Group, Assange had the highest technical proficiency. However, trouble often comes to those who walk by the river, and Assange was no exception. In September 1991, at the age of 20, Assange infiltrated Northern Telecom, a Canadian telecommunications company, and sent a provocative message to the system administrator of the Melbourne main terminal. 
the message boasted about playing in their system without causing harm, but making improvements in some areas. This message became the catalyst for their arrest. In October 1991, the police finally caught up with Assange, charging him with 31 hacking-related offences. Unable to endure the fearful and uncertain life, his wife left him, taking their young son with her. Assange faced legal trouble, admitting guilt to 25 charges, while the remaining six were dropped. Due to inadequate laws regarding hacking at the time, and the lack of actual harm caused to the targeted organizations, the court considered their actions driven by curiosity and the pleasure of surfing the internet. Consequently, Assange was fined 2,100 Australian dollars and received an 18-month suspended sentence as a deterrent. More agonizing for Assange than the criminal case was the custody battle with his ex-wife over their son, involving over 30 hearings and appeals. In 1999, after reaching a reluctant agreement, Assange regained custody of his son. On the day of the verdict, Assange, once with brown embroidered hair, had turned overnight into a man with a head full of grey and white. In order to support his son, Assange took on multiple part-time jobs during that time, making his life very challenging. In 2003, at the age of 32, Assange managed to find time amid his busy schedule to enrol at the University of Melbourne, where he studied mathematics and physics, aiming to explore the truths of the world. He performed well academically and even represented the University of Melbourne in the national physics competition. However, after a few years of study, he abruptly dropped out without completing his degree. The reason behind this decision was an event where Assange attended a conference organized by the Australian Institute of Physics. On that day, over 900 professional physicists were present, each taking turns to speak and share their views on the world, physics, and life. However, after several rounds of heated debates, Assange was deeply disappointed. Instead of witnessing scholars courageously pursuing the truth, he saw a group of timid, rule-bound, and disappointing so-called experts. Not long after the conference ended, Assange withdrew from the University of Melbourne. Subsequently, he often found himself in states of anxiety and confusion, realizing his insignificance and helplessness in the face of power. The Assange who once believed the internet was a free and equal space discovered that information technology had become a tool for authorities to manipulate the masses. Truths were hidden, and the media was controlled. In 2006, expressing his frustration, Assange wrote on his blog, I want to melt the world in acid until only the skeleton remains. In October of the same year, under Assange's leadership, a website named WikiLeaks was born. The term wiki is an abbreviation of what I know is, signifying what I know. The logo of WikiLeaks was particularly striking, featuring a melting hourglass earth, symbolizing ubiquitous black holes swallowing the truth. Assange aspired to be the hunter of those black holes, providing the public with unadorned truths. He established three guiding principles for WikiLeaks. Freedom of information, uncovering the facts, and creating and maintaining true history. In December 2006, WikiLeaks released its first set of documents, revealing the coup intentions of the Somali opposition leader, Avias. WikiLeaks' initial move shocked the world. Initially, people thought WikiLeaks was just a website rallying under the slogans of freedom and human rights, but it turned out to possess the capability to expose such significant classified information. Everyone wondered about the true intentions of this website. In 2007, WikiLeaks struck again, exposing corruption allegations against Kenya's former president, Mwa, and the current president, Kibaki, for their perceived weakness and compromise towards the Mwa family. According to the documents, Mwa embezzled £1 billion in national assets over 24 years, collaborated with drug traffickers, and engaged in counterfeit currency printing. This revelation had global repercussions, influencing even the subsequent Kenyan elections. Kibaki's reputation plummeted, and he narrowly secured victory with a meager 2% advantage. From then on, WikiLeaks' revelations became unstoppable. In 2008, WikiLeaks published Cry Blood Cry, shedding light on the killings and disappearances in Kenya's judicial trials, exposing police brutality and unjustified killings. Soon after, WikiLeaks leaked internal confidential documents of Iceland's largest bank, Kautthing Bank, revealing its debt issues and illicit lending practices. At the end of 2009, WikiLeaks collaborated with Russian hackers to release over 100 emails from the Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia in England. The emails disclosed scientists manipulating data and fabricating scientific processes to support their claims of human-induced global warming. This revelation triggered the later Climategate incident, leading many to question whether global warming was merely a pretext for developed countries to suppress developing nations. In May 2010, the New York Daily News ranked WikiLeaks as the top website that completely changed the news industry. 
If Assange had not turned his focus toward the United States, perhaps he and WikiLeaks could have even claimed the Nobel Peace Prize. In November 2007, WikiLeaks first targeted the United States, revealing a Guantanamo Bay prison management manual issued by the U.S. Department of Defense, providing ironclad evidence of human rights violations at the prison. In April 2010, WikiLeaks exposed a video of a U.S. military helicopter shooting Iraqi civilians, known as the infamous Baghdad Air Strike video. Filmed in December 2007, two U.S. Army helicopters fired on a residential area in Baghdad, causing the deaths of over a dozen people. During the attack, U.S. soldiers were seen firing and joking, resembling a scene from a computer game. The Baghdad video brought Assange and WikiLeaks to global fame, making them thorns in the eyes of the U.S. government. In November 2010, WikiLeaks released over 250,000 U.S. diplomatic cables in collaboration with several European mainstream media outlets. The cables revealed U.S. diplomats mocking then-Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin, likening him to a transparent man, and insinuating that he was the shadow emperor behind President Dmitry Medvedev. The documents even humorously compared them to DC Comics' Batman and Robin, with Putin as Batman and Medvedev as Robin. Putin responded to these revelations in an interview, calling those behind the scenes arrogant, rude, and unethical. However, Putin was not the only one to face such criticism. In July 2010, WikiLeaks disclosed 92,000 classified U.S. military documents related to the Afghanistan war, and in October of the same year, they exposed 392,000 documents concerning the Iraq war. These documents detailed the six-year period from 2004 to 2009, revealing that a total of 109,000 Iraqis lost their lives in the war, with 6 to 6,000 being ordinary civilians. WikiLeaks continued its revelations, and in November of the same year, they publicly disclosed over 250,000 secret U.S. diplomatic cables. The cables contained controversial remarks and assessments by U.S. diplomats, causing significant international repercussions. In the diplomatic cables, the then Iranian president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was likened to the Hitler of the Middle East. The then president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, was referred to as a crazy old man. Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi's every part below the waist was said to have suffered, with US diplomats describing him as arrogant, incompetent, physically and politically weak. These diplomats seem to be having a field day, openly mocking and even biting allies and their own people. French President Nicolas Sarkozy was caricatured as a thin-skinned dictator, and German Chancellor Angela Merkel was criticized for lacking creativity and risk aversion. Even then US President Boris Obama was not spared, with diplomats stating that he had no emotional attachment to Europe, preferring the East over the West. The release of these 250,000 cables was like setting off a firecracker in a haystack, spreading a foul smell worldwide. Most importantly, the cables not only involved offensive and mocking remarks by US diplomats about various world leaders, but also indicated that then US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had allegedly instructed American diplomats to secretly collect information on high-ranking United Nations officials. This included detailed biographical information, DNA fingerprints, and iris scans. The cable gate revelations triggered a severe diplomatic crisis for the United States, often referred to as the 9-11ths of the US diplomatic community. At that time, although the US government loaded Assange, they were powerless against him and WikiLeaks. Learning from his previous arrest experience, Assange had prepared thoroughly for this situation. WikiLeaks had nine board members in its structure, but only Assange publicly disclosed his identity. The other five WikiLeaks members and five formal staff were all volunteers. Their goal was not to make money through leaks, but to create an encrypted platform where anyone could anonymously upload information. The identities of the uploaders were encrypted at multiple levels, even Assange himself did not know their real identities. Legally, WikiLeaks had no obligation to keep information confidential, and it did not engage in direct hacking activities. Moreover, once governments filed lawsuits, it indirectly acknowledged the authenticity of the documents WikiLeaks had disclosed. However, with the case being in the spotlight, in December 2010, internet giant Amazon and the US domain name system provider EveryDNS, under government pressure, announced the termination of services for WikiLeaks. Subsequently, the fund accounts used by WikiLeaks to receive donations were frozen. Worst of all, at the end of 2010, at the request of the Swedish police, Interpol issued a red notice for Assange on charges of sexual assault. In August 2010, Assange had been invited to Stockholm, Sweden, to give a lecture. On August 14, Assange had a sexual encounter with a female assistant professor Anna, and during their intimate moments, the condom broke. Two days later, Assange had another encounter with a fan who admired him, facing another condom issue. Shortly after, on August 20, 
Both women reported the incidents, claiming that Assange had forced them into sexual encounters. The media flooded in, covering the case extensively. In May 2010, the New York Daily News ranked WikiLeaks as the first among websites that completely changed the news industry. If Assange had not also targeted the United States, maybe he and WikiLeaks could have even claimed the Nobel Peace Prize. In November 2007, WikiLeaks first targeted the United States by releasing a Guantanamo Bay prison management manual issued by the U.S. Department of Defense, providing irrefutable evidence of human rights violations at the prison. On November 18, 2010, the Stockholm District Court issued an arrest warrant for Assange, but this did not deter him. Just 10 days later, on November 28, Assange initiated the shocking 9-11-style diplomatic cable leak, humiliating leaders worldwide. On December 1, Interpol, based in Lyon, decided to assist Sweden in issuing a global red notice to 188 member countries, vowing to apprehend Assange. The fact that Assange couldn't control his impulses was true, but many netizens questioned whether this seemed like a setup. How could Interpol mobilize globally for a condom issue? Regardless, Assange did not choose to become a fugitive. On December 7, 2010, he surrendered to the British police in London. Subsequently, Assange was imprisoned at Wandsworth Prison in the UK. An article by the Washington Post journalist claimed Assange was not a journalist, but a spy who deserved imprisonment. Assange was not surprised. He knew that many journalists were essentially stenographers for the ruling class. During his time at Wandsworth Prison, Assange received numerous letters of support and even a copy of Time magazine. The magazine featured Assange on the cover, with his mouth sealed by the American flag, symbolizing the US attempt to silence him. In December 2011, supporters raised the bail money for Assange, and he walked out of prison. However, in May 2012, the UK's Supreme Court ruled for Assange's extradition to Sweden for trial. During the bail period, Assange, disguised as a career, sought refuge in the Embassy of Ecuador in the UK. He remained there for seven years. People might wonder why Ecuador was willing to antagonize many other countries for Assange. On one hand, Ecuador already had diplomatic conflicts with the United States. On the other hand, then-Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa had his considerations. He believed that supporting Assange would increase his domestic popularity. Many Ecuadorians had negative impressions of European and American countries, and sheltering Assange could help Correa portray himself as a champion against imperialism. Additionally, in 2012, Correa closed 14 media outlets in Ecuador, facing criticism for suppressing freedom of speech. By supporting Assange, he aimed to demonstrate his commitment to free speech and portray the closures as actions against corrupt media. All these moves could pave the way for the 2013 presidential elections. And so, Assange began his seven-year confinement in an 18-square-meter room inside the Embassy of Ecuador in the UK. In this room, he continued to challenge authority. In June 2013, former CIA employee Edward Snowden handed two top-secret documents to The Guardian in the UK and The Washington Post in the US. On June 5, The Guardian released the first bombshell, revealing the NSA's classified project, codenamed PRISM, which required telecom giant Verizon to turn over millions of users' call records daily. On June 6, The Washington Post dropped the second bomb, disclosing that the NSA and FBI, over the past six years, had been monitoring private information such as emails, chat records, videos, and photos of US citizens by infiltrating servers of major tech companies like Microsoft, Google, Apple, and Yahoo. This triggered public outcry and became known as the PRISM scandal. Following the incident, Snowden sought assistance from WikiLeaks. With its global network, WikiLeaks helped Snowden successfully escape to Russia, where he sought political asylum. In 2015, WikiLeaks exposed multiple instances of the US eavesdropping on leaders of other countries. Leaders from 35 countries, including then UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, German Chancellor Merkel, Brazilian President Rousseff, and three French presidents, appeared on the NSA's monitoring list. By 2016, during the US presidential election, the competition between Trump and Clinton was intense. From the Democratic primaries in February 2016 to the final vote, Clinton consistently led in most polls, particularly during the last three televised debates from September to October. However, on election day, the situation took a turn. Despite brief periods of Clinton leading, Trump maintained overall dominance and ultimately defeated Clinton 306 to 232 in the Electoral College, achieving the best Republican performance since 1988. Assange and WikiLeaks played a significant role in the late stages of the election. They released over 19,000 emails from Clinton's team, spanning from January 2015 to May 2016. The emails revealed that Clinton used a private email server for public affairs, including handling classified information. 
Moreover, she intentionally created negative material to undermine Democratic rival Bernie Sanders and Republican candidate Trump. These revelations exposed the manipulation of public opinion, attacks on political opponents, and even collaboration with terrorists within the Democratic Party, leading to a collapse of Clinton's public image and indirectly facilitating Trump's election as president. During the 2016 election, Trump had expressed admiration for WikiLeaks on multiple occasions. However, after taking office, perhaps under the pressure of his position, Trump changed his stance, claiming he knew nothing about WikiLeaks. He stated that it was not his concern and expressed trust in the capable decisions of the Justice Department. Trump disassociated himself from Assange, asserting that he had no knowledge of WikiLeaks or Assange's activities. In 2012, shortly after Assange sought refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, then Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa welcomed him, jokingly saying he could stay at the embassy for centuries. However, as time passed, Ecuador faced economic challenges and a growing urgency to rebuild relations with the West. The new president, Lenin Moreno, who took office in 2017, displayed a less friendly attitude towards Assange. In 2018, the Ecuadorian embassy started restricting Assange's internet access and implemented a set of rules supposedly for maintaining cleanliness and hygiene in his room. The rules also prohibited him from having visitors other than his legal team. Assange later accused the Ecuadorian government of installing surveillance devices in his room, monitoring his daily life. This led him to play white noise or use household appliances like blenders to counteract the alleged monitoring devices. In October 2018, Assange sued the Ecuadorian government, claiming a violation of his basic human rights. President Moreno, in response, stated that Assange's actions violated asylum conditions and announced the revocation of his protection, urging him to leave the embassy. In April 2019, the UK police were granted permission to enter the Ecuadorian embassy in London, arresting Assange and taking him into custody. In May of the same year, Assange was sentenced to 50 weeks in prison and held in London's Belmarsh prison. Subsequently, the United States filed 18 charges against Assange under the Espionage Act, with the potential for a 175-year prison sentence if convicted. Given his current health condition, such a sentence could be equivalent to a death sentence. In June 2019, the United States applied for Assange's extradition. Assange's life has been tumultuous, evolving from a fugitive to a champion of democracy, capturing attention from the masses to becoming an incarcerated individual. The controversy persists over whether he is a brave whistleblower exposing darkness or a mad espionage spy. Daniel Benjamin, a former US diplomat and coordinator for counterterrorism at the State Department, leans toward considering Assange as a spy, given that the information he disclosed was obtained through illegitimate means. However, Kristen Craftenson, former WikiLeaks spokesperson, has a different perspective, viewing Assange's actions as a form of journalism. Regardless of the information source, as long as it serves the public interest, a journalist has a responsibility to publish it. Time magazine believes that the information Assange disclosed wasn't top secret, as numerous military personnel or government officials in the US had access to similar so-called secrets. Assange's phenomenon is seen as a societal outcome in the era of information technology, fundamentally related to freedom of speech and information. In January 2021, the London court ruled on the Assange extradition case, stating that extraditing him to a US prison could further deteriorate his mental and physical condition, given his pre-existing depression and Asperger's syndrome, and increase the risk of suicide. Consequently, the extradition request was denied. Subsequently, the US assured that Assange would not be held in solitary confinement or transferred to a high-security prison. In December 2021, the UK High Court overturned the lower court's decision, in June 2022, UK Home Secretary Priti Patel issued a statement confirming her approval of the US government's extradition request. Despite the swift and forceful actions by authorities, Assange had prepared a contingency plan. In July 2010, anticipating his impending fate, he released a 1.4 GB encrypted file on the WikiLeaks website, referred to as the insurance file. Its contents were claimed to impact not only the United States, but also determine the global geopolitical landscape. Countless netizens have downloaded this file, which Assange encrypted with a highly complex system that remains uncracked to date. In the event of any misfortune befalling Assange or WikiLeaks, someone holds the public key to unlock the file. Assange stated that this served as his last line of defense against authoritarianism. The file might signify that the story of Assange is not conclusively concluded and could potentially continue to unfold in the future a continued war between him and the forces of authority. That's all for today's video. I know this topic might not get a lot of views, but I do want to share the story of Assange. 
There is no right or wrong or any stance in this video, sometimes, in nowadays society, it is somehow difficult to determine what is right or wrong. If you want to continue supporting this channel, remember to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell to ensure you don't miss any episodes. Lastly, if being radical is the new norm and objectivity is considered heretical, perhaps we should be radically objective. Until next time, stay curious and stay unconventional.